Hey, what's going on everybody? This is Dr. Tim as well as Dr. Joel Miller here. Um, today we're going to be diving into episode six of the Freedom to Flourish podcast. The topic for today is going to be gut health and that's a, a big umbrella term for all sorts of things. So actually what we're going to do is, is part one is going to be today and then next week we're going to release we're going to release uh, part two where we cover more lower GI stuff. So today's going to be focused more upper GI, next week more lower GI. And uh, yeah, hopefully we answer, answer all your questions today. And uh, yeah, let's just get right into it. Awesome. Awesome. Glad to be here. Always, as always, good to see you, Dr. Tim. Uh, this one's going to be exciting. This is one that we've talked about for a long time. We've talked about doing this one. We've talked about it with uh, some of our other episodes because as some people um, say, the gut health is connected to everything. And I think that um, in one way or another, we can uh, kind of verify and confirm that the gut health is connected to, to just about everything. So um, so here's kind of the, the rundown for our listener as far as uh, what we're going to get into with this part one episode of gut health and digestive health. We're going to talk about digestion from A to Z. Dr. Tim is going to walk us through that. Um, digestion from A to Z. What does that mean? It's it's just we're gonna we're gonna go through the fundamentals of digestion and, and basically what's happening. How does our body actually operate and function? And you know we we talk a lot uh, about the uh, when it comes to functional medicine. We we emphasize the word functional because we have to understand how the body functions and what it's trying to do. So we're gonna get into that with digestion and and kind of uh, add some knowledge here to the conversation. Next, we're gonna get into some of the drivers of gut health issues. Um, Basically, we're going to um, talk about the different things that, that cause all the gut problems and digestive complaints. Um, and after we kind of go through a kind of an overview of that, we'll jump into some very specific digestive complaints. We'll talk about heartburn. We'll talk about um, as far as in this episode, the upper GI complaints, that is, we'll talk about heartburn, uh, some uh, peptic ulcers. We'll get into gallstones. We'll get into constipation. And then in part two, we're going to get into a lot more there as far as bloating gas diarrhea abdominal pain SIBO SIFO celiac disease bloating food sensitivities all that fun stuff and then of course we'll we'll get into some other things too talking about our favorite gut health foods we're going to get into some answering some different questions about gut health that we get all the time from patients talking about should everyone take a probiotic should we be doing parasite cleanses every year all that fun stuff so Dr. Tim, uh, let's jump in. Digestion A to Z, start us off, um, and uh, and we'll we'll start there. Yeah, perfect. So what most people don't realize is digestion starts with sight and smell. So when you start cooking your dinner and you start smelling it, your body starts to secrete more uh, digestive enzymes in your in your saliva as well as in your stomach, all those things. So your body starts to prepare itself to consume food before you even taste anything. Um, but then from there, you know, it starts with our mouth into our esophagus um, and down to into our stomach. So in our, in our mouth, there's a variety of different things that'll go on. So first off we taste everything and our brain will actually integrate things uh, in our body where say there's something that the body is really craving like salt or, or things like that. Um, a lot of that happens because of a need for salt, um, not necessarily with sugar. That's more so a blood sugar dysregulation thing, but salt's a great example for something that your body really, really needs. And if you're low on it, you'll crave it, your body tastes it, and then it'll kind of downregulate those, those cravings uh, just based on uh, integration with the parotid glands and, and how, how the body perceives what you are tasting. Um, then from there, it'll secrete all sorts of uh, uh, salivary uh, enzymes that are going to start breaking down sugars and, and proteins and all those things. And uh, it also is necessary to lubricate food as it moves down your esophagus. So sufficient uh, saliva is going to help with that. Then once it's into your esophagus, it, it goes through to your stomach. Once you get to your stomach, there's a, a couple different things that are going to happen. Um, hydrochloric acid or stomach acid is going to ramp up to digest the food. Um, people with low acid will actually uh, have issues here um, where they can have maybe some heartburn or, or gallbladder issues just because uh, they're not digesting their food properly. So super important for that. But anyway, so uh, stomach acids there, pepsin to help digest proteins. Uh, all those things are going to really get things going uh, in the stomach and prepare for stuff downstream. Another thing that I want to mention is intrinsic factor. So intrinsic factor is this uh, enzyme that is going to allow our bodies to properly digest and absorb vitamin B12. 
which is necessary for methylation, as well as a variety of other things. So super, super, super important. Um, then from there, once all the food's sufficiently digested in the stomach, hopefully, um, moves through to the small intestine. Once it gets there, uh, that's where the pancreas as well as the gallbladder start to do some things to mitigate that acid a little bit. So what the pancreas will do is secrete um, something called bicarbonate. What bicarbonate does is it's very basic. And so it balances out the pH of that food as it's moving through there. So that way you don't burn the, uh, the small intestine. Then from there, the gallbladder is going to secrete bile, which will help with uh, digestion of uh, fats, as well as absorption of fat, or fat soluble vitamins like vitamins A, D, E, and K, um, as well as a variety of other things. So uh, bile is super important in that step. It's also going to help lubricate the intestines to help with proper motility. And so a lot of times gallbladder issues will lead to some issues like uh, constipation and stuff like that. So anyway, so the pancreas as well as the gallbladder feed into the most or the highest part of the small intestine once it leaves the stomach. Um, and then from there, you'll just snake through the small intestine where the overwhelming majority of nutrient absorption is going to occur. So um, not necessarily water, anything like that, but for the most part, all other nutrients are going to be absorbed through the small intestine. Then from there, in your lower right quadrant, you have this little bundle of muscle. It's called the ileocecal valve, and that's where the small and the large intestine meet. Uh, this valve separates these two organs, and once food starts to move through there, you hit the large intestine where water absorption uh, ramps up significantly to where it prepares the mostly digested food for excretion through the stool. So um, you'll kind of have things snake through the large intestine at that point, and then that's... Uh, we all know how that ends. So um, that's that's digestion in a, nuts, in a nutshell. Um, lots of things that can be troublesome with the digestive tract. So it's a long snaking pathway. And with everything going on with our foods, as well as toxins in our world nowadays, um, there can be plenty of issues. So today we're going to really, really dig into those things. Absolutely. And it all starts with just that understanding that you just kind of walked us through of um, exactly where digestion starts and how it kind of works through. And every, to the listener, every part of that process is important. Whenever one of those parts of the process is off, you're going to be prone to having some kind of digestive issues. And, and uh, eventually it could lead to some of the complaints and things that we're, get, we're going to get into here in a second. Um, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about as you're walking through that was, you know, we, we talk about the the beginning of digestion really starts with seeing your food and smelling your food. And I think about how many times uh, or how many people uh, will eat food through the fast food window. If you're eating food through the fast food window, you don't really get to smell it. You don't really get to see it. Uh, it you take it out of the bag and then it goes into your digestive system. And a lot of times your body is not going to necessarily be able to optimally digest it. Obviously, number one, there's a lot of processed foods and it's not going to be very healthy for you anyways. But um, you know, when you don't really get to see it and smell it as it's being prepared, that's going to, uh, uh, that's going to result in, um, less than optimal digestion there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the other thing I want to mention too, is, you know, so many people are on, um, uh, proton pump inhibitors, right? When we talk about stomach acid, we're going to get into gastric reflux here in a second, but that stomach acid is the biggest thing for the release of enzymes from your pancreas, the bile being released from your gallbladder and then of course different enzymes being released from your small intestine there so um that stomach acid is so 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 important and uh you know when it comes to the, the release of all these different enzymes so awesome awesome um all right so let's jump into the drivers of gut health issues um obviously we have i would say uh, we would agree that the two biggest ones are probably going to be infections and foods um Let's kind of start with talking about infections and then I'll, I'll pass it on to you and, and we'll jump into foods as well. And of course, chime in anytime you have something to add. So when it comes to infections, we're primarily talking about uh, what we call is uh, gut dysbiosis. So if you have gut dysbiosis, there's some kind of infection in your gut. It could be parasitic, could be bacterial, could be fungal, could even be viral. Although I would say that viral is probably uh, much less um, uh, much less something we're going to see there. So these gut infections, uh, like I said, can range anywhere from parasites to bacteria to fungus. They're going to cause 
lots of inflammation. They're going to absor uh, basically hinder nutrient absorption so that we're not going to uh, absorb our nutrients very well. And then they're also going to um, also give off different toxicities. So sometimes we'll talk about aldehyde toxicities or ammonia toxicities, and those can back up our system. Those can cause issues with our liver, gallbladder, and it's just kind of can become a, a nasty, vicious cycle. So, uh, so we've got the infections there. Um, Dr. Tim, anything you would add to, to the infections in general? Not for the time being, we're going to get into those plenty in the future. Yeah, for sure. For sure. All right. Well, let's jump into foods a little bit. What would you say is most important as far as foods and how it impacts our gut health? So food specifically, um, there's a variety of ways that it can affect digestion. So um, starting with the stomach, there could be some sort of histamine reaction going on where there is some sort of minor allergic reaction. That can lead to things like heartburn, all that stuff. Um, plenty of foods can do that. Nightshades are huge for that. Alcohol, huge, absolutely huge for that. Um, as well as dairy, things like that can, can definitely cause issues there. Um, I would say nightshades and alcohol are high in that list though. So those are high up there. Um, Lower GI uh, things with foods can be, you know, it can cause diarrhea, can cause constipation. Uh, celiac disease is a great example of autoimmunity involving involving a, uh, a specific food, specifically gluten. Um, lots of people have issues with things like eggs or dairy, um, not even just necessarily the lactose component, but the, the casein, the milk proteins, where they're having some sort of sensitivity there. Um, so there's a lot of different foods that can drive issues with the large, or I'm sorry, the digestive tract. It's just a matter of where throughout the digestive tract these issues are arising and what foods specifically are causing issues. Uh, another thing that we got to think about is, is it a, is it a gut issue or is it an immune issue? So in the case of, uh, a lot of true food sensitivities, it is an immune issue where the immune system through the gut is attacking foods. Um, a lot of times there's this, uh, there's this phenomenon that most people I'm sure that are listening have heard of. It's called leaky gut. And it's even probably 10 years ago now, it was super popular where, um, kind of came into, into understanding where think of your, throughout your entire large intestine, small intestine, um, you have these little, little pancake shaped cells. They're very flat and they're, and they're wide. They should fit very snugly up against each other. And over time, when there's things like infections, like how Dr. Dr. Joel just mentioned, um, and other inflammatory drivers like food sensitivities, what's going to happen is inflammation happens. These, these cells start to have gaps between them. Then from there, proteins and, and things that aren't supposed to leak through to the uh, bloodstream make their way through. And that's where the immune system starts ta attacking things even further. And that's where a lot of glu gluten sensitivities, specifically not just celiac, but gluten sensitivities arise from. Um, and so a lot of food sensitivities are the result of infections uh, within the gut, such as dysbiosis in the large intestine, SIBO in the small intestine, all those things. So it's not necessarily a, I mean, it is an immune issue, but it's rooted in what's wrong with the gut itself. Um, other, other times it is a full-blown histamine reaction, allergic reaction with foods. So um, whenever there are issues of foods, we kind of have to think, is it, is it the gut or is it the immune system and, and address it that way? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that I always encourage patients, just like you mentioned, when it comes to foods, a lot of patients come in, they're like, yeah, I, I want to check food sensitivities. When I eat food, I feel terrible. And it's really important to differentiate that the immune sense, immune system, food sensitivities, which will generally lead to things like skin issues, joint pain, inflammation, things like that. And then the, the other option with that that we'll often see, the other um, kind of mechanism there is these infections that are there in the gut, this gut dysbiosis. Certain foods may feed those infections and then cause just a flare-up of all these different gut issues. And a lot of times that's something that we'll see. So, um, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about this more as we get into part two of this gut health talk, as we get into things like bloating and things like that. But uh, if you have some kind of fungus or bacteria, right, and you're eating a bunch of sugar, or you're eating um, a lot of inflammatory foods, a lot of those things can feed um, those, um, those infections, cause them to flare up, and then result in your symptoms getting a lot worse. Your bloating gets a lot worse, your constipation gets worse, your gas gets worse, and so on and so on. 
Um, Dr. Tim, I know that we've talked a little bit about things like lectins and oxalates. I know in the functional world, people will talk about those as being massive issues with gut health. Um, we both stand um, in uh, the similar camp here as far as our thoughts on that. But um, tell, talk to me a little bit about lectins and, and oxalates. And, and do you think those really do cause a lot of issues for people? I think those are, I, I'd like to compare it to something like salt. So think of the typical, you know, average American, should they avoid salt? You know, that's what we've heard our entire lives. Salt is bad for you because it causes high blood pressure. It might make high blood pressure worse, but that's not what drives your, your blood pressure to go high in the first place. Salt is a super necessary nutrient for proper nerve function, proper uh, hydration, all sorts of things. And so it's one of those things, is it the root cause or is it a symptom? When it comes to oxalates, um, lectins, all those things, it is 99.999% of the time a symptom rather than a root cause. Now, that's not to say that if you are really struggling to solve a complex gut issue that somebody might feel really, really good from avoiding oxalates or lectins and all those things for a long time or for a short period until you get the root issue figured out. That's not what I'm saying at all. It could very well help calm the symptoms down. It's just not going to solve the root issue. It's it's uh, very similar to, say you do have some SIBO or some dysbiosis going on in the, in the large intestine. Um, a lot of these patients, they'll have bloating, constipation, diarrhea, whatever their symptoms are, and they go on carnivore. And magically, they think, oh, this is like the magic perfect diet because all my symptoms are gone. Well, let's go back to what you just said about foods that will feed gut bugs. Gut, gut bugs are going to eat sugars, starches, fibers, all those things. Um, and they don't really eat a whole lot of our protein. So people who get on carnivore are going to be super uh, restrictive when it comes to what sorts of uh, macronutrients uh, as well as micronutrients get into the body. And so 99.9% .9 of the things that gut bugs are going to feed off of aren't, uh, aren't going to be introduced. Therefore, numbers will decrease and symptoms will, will temporarily resolve. But what I hear all the time is patients that reintroduce these, uh, these foods back um, beyond carnivore is they start having symptoms again. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Just because you're not having symptoms doesn't mean that the issue is solved. So right. when it comes to lectins, oxalates, um, all those things, I see that as being generally the same thing. You can use them to calm symptomatology in the, in the short term um, while you're solving the complex underlying issue. But if you don't solve the underlying issue, they're going to continue to cause problems once they're added back. But if you, if you deal with the dysbiosis, uh, leaky gut, all those things and, uh, strengthen the immune barrier of the gut that they tend to do, or they tend to not cause any issues at that point. Very well said. And that's essentially, you know, we talk about food sensitivities with the immune system. I'm telling patients about that all the time. We, you know, avoiding the food, right. Which is kind of standard protocol with food sensitivity issues. You avoid the food for 120 days and then you slowly, or you, well, depending on the, the method, you may slowly add it back in, or you may add it back in quickly and see just if your body is over it or if you can handle it again. But one of the challenges with that is with food sensitivities, like you mentioned, coming from some of the leaky gut issues, if you don't heal the gut, but you just avoid the food, all you're doing is taking the um, gasoline um, out of the picture and stopping it from being thrown onto the fire. Well, that doesn't mean the fire is just going to go out eventually um, or, or quickly um, at that at that point. Um, so taking the gasoline away is going to be helpful. It's going to help calm things down a little bit or at least stop things from getting worse. Uh, but you still have to essentially put the fire out and address the underlying issues. So I'm with you there, I'm with you there. All right, let's jump into, um, so let's talk about chemical exposure. Um, this is one that I think gets overlooked a little bit when it comes to gut health and, and the drivers of all these different gut issues. So when we talk about chemical exposure, a lot of people are familiar with pesticides being very bad for the gut. So pesticides, um, basically glyphosate being the biggest one that's going to be found in things like Roundup um, and a lot of different sprays that are used um, agriculturally, sometimes on our foods, things like that. Um, all of those things, they're, the purpose behind pesticides is to either kill certain bacteria that, um, that may grow on the, the fruit or produce um, or um, 
So either to kill it or keep it from growing. And what happens when that gets into our body is it literally acts like an antibiotic. So if we're exposed to pesticides that are being sprayed outside near our home, uh, if they're on a lot of our foods, that's we're basically getting micro doses of antibiotics every single time. And that can cause a lot of different issues. Um, other chemical exposure, if you're drinking tap water, you need to stop immediately because there's so many chemicals in there, chemicals you can't even pronounce. And if you can't pronounce it, you probably shouldn't be putting it in your body. So um, one of the things uh, as far as tap water goes um, that Dr. Tim and I would generally recommend is uh, going online to, uh, is it ewg.org? Dr. Tim, do you remember? Um, I'm not entirely sure what you yeah. did. No, you're good. Uh, EW, I believe it's uh, ewg.org. Let me look it up real quick. But essentially, you can go on, you put your zip code in, and you can look up exactly what's in the tap water, uh, where you're located. So um, yeah. it is, yeah. it's environmental working group, um, ewg.org. Uh, and so, yeah, go on there, put your zip code in, see what comes up in your tap water. Um, so obviously, we shouldn't be drinking the tap water. It's also really important to understand that if you're showering with tap water, you're still exposing your body to all these chemicals. It might not be inside your body directly, but whatever gets put on our skin, our skin will generally absorb those things. So you can actually cause a lot of gut issues over time uh, simply by exposing yourself to a lot of these different chemicals in the water. Um, you could add different cleaning products and things like that to the equation as well. If you're always using different cleaning products that are full of chemicals, right, that could be harsh on your overall um, gut microbiome and, and things like that as well. And then probably the last thing as far as chemical exposure that I would add is actually going to be um, different synthetic uh, chemicals, different synthetic drugs, pharmaceuticals, things like that. Um, over time, they can tend to cause different issues. Um, and uh, simply because they're synthetic, they're not natural things. Our gut doesn't always do well with these different things. Um, and then I would actually add uh, to kind of piggyback on that a little bit is any improper supplementation. Any improper supplementation can cause issues with your gut health. If you're taking a supplement that is not good for you, uh, especially herbs, it can cause issues for you. Uh, if you're taking any kind of supplement for too long or at too high of a dose, um, it could, and you're, and you're experiencing gut issues, um, it's important to kind of see if, if that's connected there and kind of consider that a little bit. Um, one of the things that people most often over supplement with in regards to gut health is probiotics. And, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more in the, in the next, um, in the part two of gut health here, as we get into more of the, the lower GI SIBO, CFO type issues. Um, but you know, most people don't really need a probiotic. Um, and a lot of times there's, there's gut infections that need to be dealt with and there's more gut diversity that needs to be built up through our foods rather than probiotics. So that's the um, chemical exposure and then a little bit of some improper supplementation. Those things can cause a lot of our gut issues as well. They can be a lot of the drivers of the things that, um, that so often ail us uh, as far as our gut health goes. Um, and then I know the last thing we want to talk about, Dr. Tim, was some autoimmune stuff with the gut. Tell me um, a little bit about um, how you're viewing that. Um, I'm just looking at it like uh, general autoimmunity. So just think back to our previous podcast uh, where we talked about autoimmunity and how you get the decreased TH1, increased TH2 uh, immune balance. And over time, you're going to start producing TH17, which is going to produce interleukin-17, which will then produce antibodies. So in specific conditions uh, like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, celiac disease, those are a few examples of autoimmune things that will be going on in the gut. Um, those, yes, there is definitely some sort of gut component where there's leaky gut, there's dysbiosis, food sensitivities, all those things. Um, but think back to that previous episode where we talked about, okay, there's the gut issues, the dysbiosis that's driving inflammation that will lead to increased TH2s. There's food sensitivities, metals, mold, parasites, allergies, all these things are going to hike that side up. Uh, in the case of autoimmune issues, as it relates to the gut, it's just a matter of what the weakest link for the body is and where, where it's going to attack. So the immune system, in the case of ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, those things, it is, it is just choosing, or that's the weakest link, where the body is attacking the gut. And so in these cases, it is a bit more complex than just a straightforward dysbiosis where 
you take two to three herbs over the course of six weeks and you're good to go. Um, you have to deal with that component for sure. I would, I would guess that 99% of people who have those things going on, if not a hundred percent are going to have some sort of dysbiosis going on. Uh, so you have to deal with that. You undoubtedly have to deal with the, uh, immune barrier of the gut, the secretory IgA, um, you have to really, really help that repair the gut as well as dealing with whatever immune components are going on that might be affecting or might be uh, responding to things like mold, metals, uh, pesticides, you name it, all sorts of things. So it, it changes, changes things from being strictly a gut issue most of the time to being a gut issue as well as an immune issue. So you have to look at it from both sides, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And we know that, you know, when it comes to gut issues, a lot of times our standard healthcare system is not that great at getting to the bottom of those things, unless there's some kind of significant disease diagnosis that's easy to spot in, in standard testing. Um, but the, the Crohn's and, and ulcerative colitis, that's definitely a tough one. You know, a lot of patients that, that we see with these different issues, they've not had a lot of great success with kind of the standard treatments. And, and so taking your approach and the understanding that you just shared is huge. Uh, and, and understanding, again, a lot of the different root issues that will lead to all the inflammation, all the things that we've kind of gone through as far as the infections and foods and, and all those different issues. So very, very good stuff. Very good stuff. All right. So let's move next here to talking about a lot of these common digestive complaints. So um, the, the main ones here that we're going to jump into for this part one of uh, gut health is going to be heartburn. We're going to get into um, sharp stomach pain after meals. We're going to get into gallstones. We're going to get we're going to get into constipation a little bit, um, and then in part two, we're going to get into more of the uh, lower GI issues like bloating, gas, diarrhea, abdominal pain, bleeding, gluten allergies, things like that. So um, let's talk about heartburn a little bit, Doctor Tim. What um, what are you seeing a lot of times when patients come in with heartburn complaints? Um, what's your thought process? How are you looking at this? So believe it or not, when somebody's experiencing heartburn, it is usually a low stomach acid issue rather than a high stomach acid issue, yep. which rewind to when we talked about PPIs and uh, medications that will decrease stomach acid. If that really is the case, then why are they giving out medications that are going to de decrease stomach acid even further? Um, a common uh, reason that a lot of people will not want to take these medications long term is they they drive uh, osteoporosis later on in life. They can, they can lead to poor calcium absorption, absorption over time and uh, really hurt bone mineral density. The reason for that is low acid means that you're not going to absorb calcium properly and you're not going to push it into tissues. You need high acid to do that. So uh, just an example of how those can, can cause issues there um, and why a lot of people want to get off of them. But there's a, there's a handful of people that I actually see in my, in my office right now that are active patients that they, they, their primary care gave them some sort of uh, acid suppressing medication, and they've since developed all sorts of issues. Um, so it's, yeah, heartburn is usually low acid as well as some sort of, maybe some sort of food sensitivity, um, things like that. I'll very, very often see a hiatal hernia with it as well. So what a hiatal hernia is, at least within the medical diagnosis, is where the stomach will push up through the uh, cardiac sphincter where the uh, diaphragm as well as the uh, esophagus and stomach meet. Stomach will push up through there and it will poke through the diaphragm actually. When we're talking hiatal hernia, at least in our context, we're talking more of like a, a pseudo hiatal hernia or some sort of neurologic disruption due to compensations and injuries and all those things where the diaphragm is not really functioning properly and now there's the stomach. And so it will kind of, kind of push up in there a little bit. I, I don't for a second believe that things are pushing all the way through, but it's definitely mm -hmm. pushing upwards for sure. Um, I don't want anybody to go saying we're, you know, doing uh, CTs or ultrasounds, all that stuff to figure it out. What's, what's going on with that. Um, it's more so just a, a symptom based diagnosis as well as, uh, what we, what we come up with, with our neurologic testing. So, um, with heartburn, there's food sensitivities, low acid. Um, and then that hiatal hernia, uh, with hiatal hernias, it can be traced back to a stomach issue. And then, um, a stomach issue can also be traced back to the hiatal hernia. So what do I mean by that? Um, with 
the way that we do things with the applied kinesiology, we'll often try to tie as many indicators as we can together. So we'll, we'll go through, we'll check some stomach related muscles. We'll check to see if the hiatal hernia is, is testing by itself and see, okay, what, where is one lining up higher up in the hierarchy and which one's lower uh, and which one seems to be the root rather than the, the symptom. So um, a lot of times I'll see where the hiatal hernia goes back to the stomach and then we treat the stomach nutritionally and it does a lot better. Um, so we'll, we'll increase stomach acid or we'll eliminate a food or we'll do an herb for some sort of H. pylori infection or whatever's going on. And that will resolve that hiatal hernia issue. Or I'll often see where heartburn is a symptom, stomach is testing in the clear, and then it'll go to a hiatal hernia thing. Um, and then from there, you just clear out some myofascial injuries that are somehow affecting that. And it'll totally resolve symptoms like that right there with that patient. So it's just a matter of figuring out, okay, where are we going? What's, what's the root cause rather than the symptom? And, and how are we going to go about this? Um, I would say most of the time, low acid and supplementing with uh, betaine HCL or betaine hydro hydrochloride is necessary. Um, just for the sake of if you're having some sort of uh, disruption uh, via stress, via histamine, food sensitivities, all, all the stuff that can lead to low stomach acid production, you need to kind of retrain your body to increase acid again. And so that's where um, I'll have patients, they'll start with uh, one betaine HCL between meals, and they'll do that right before, or before breakfast, between breakfast and lunch, between lunch and dinner, and then hopefully later in the evening before they go to bed. Um, as long as there's nothing else in the stomach, that way the resting state of acid is, is higher and we can kind of retrain the stomach to keep a higher acid level. Um, and, uh, I've seen it where patients, they, they have heartburn and then the next day they start doing that. And they're like, I, I never would have thought that if I would take more acid, my reflux would go away. So it's kind of this counterintuitive intuitive thing. Um, but what will drive that heartburn with low acid is, um, the, uh, cardiac sphincter that I mentioned before, it, uh, it responds to an acidic environment. And so when you're stressed and acid goes low or you have food sensitivity and acid goes low, what's going to happen is the, the valve is going to kind of open up a little bit. And when that valve open up, opens up in response to those things um, that drives acid low is that acid pokes through. And that's why you feel the acid at that point. Um, as soon as we introduce more acid and the valve close, closes, that's why the symptoms go away. And so low acid causes that to open, that's where you feel it. And then high acid causes it to close, blocking it off so you don't feel it anymore. Um, that's pretty much it when it comes to heartburn. Um, trying to think if there's anything else that I missed. Um, a lot of times, some people will say that gallbladder health and function there will contribute to heartburn as well. Uh, the way that that relates is if there's sluggish bile, I'm sorry, if there's low acid, wait, no, I, I got to make sure I'm thinking about this right. <laughs> if <laughs> there is sluggish bile and you are not able to digest fats properly in the small intestine, what will happen sometimes with some people is um, the digestion will kind of slow. And so once all those indigestible fats and uh, poorly digest, digested proteins make their way into the small intestine, uh, motility will kind of slow. So then that way things will kind of hang out in the stomach way too long. Um, and that can lead to increased acid and, and heartburn and all that stuff. Um, I don't see that in my practice as much, but that is, that is a thought, um, that I've read in, in numerous texts that kind of relates all the upper GI stuff together in that way. So if things are not functioning well in one Avenue, the other upper GI organs have to make up for it. So gallbladder is not functioning properly. So stomach has to ramp up acid and it leads to a, a high acid issue. Um, that leads to heartburn, which doesn't happen much, but then on the flip side, um, hopefully other things downstream can compensate for the stomach not doing its thing. But, um, yeah, I, I, I don't see that as often, um, mainly the food sensitivities, hiatal hernia stuff, as well as the low acid due to stress, histamine, all those things. So, um, I think that's, I think that's it for heartburn. Do you have anything else, Dr. Joel? Yeah, see, I've seen a lot of different heartburn patients and we've generally gotten really, really good results. I, I would say um, a couple of things to add there. Um, number one, you know, you obviously have to take a holistic approach when it comes to heartburn and gastric reflux issues. You have to consider food sensitivities, consider potentially infections, consider low stomach acid, things like that. 
um, I've had a lot of people that are that come in and they've been put on these proton pump inhibitors. And what it actually does, yes, it can relieve their symptoms, but having that even lower stomach acid oftentimes will actually lead to other gut issues. Um, you know, I talked a little bit earlier about how that stomach acid is really important for your uh, to stimulate your other organs to release their enzymes through digestion. So if you are on that proton pump inhibitor and you're not making enough stomach acid, then your other organs, your pancreas, your gallbladder, your small intestine, all these different organs are not going to be able to digest food very well. If you don't digest food very well, that leads to nutrient um, uh, absorption issues, that leads to nutrient deficiencies. Uh, it can oftentimes lead to um, opportunistic infection type issues. So you don't have enough stomach acid, Stomach acid is one of our number one, uh, our first defense for things like parasites. If there's some kind of bacteria or parasite, something in our food, um, the stomach acid is supposed to burn that thing up and get rid of it. But if we have low stomach acid and all of a sudden, uh, just through that, that simple fact and simple factor alone, our gut health, our gut immune system is now vulnerable. So super, super important. I see a lot of food sensitivities, a lot of things, um, that, you know, when people have these issues for a long time, when you have gastric reflux issues for a long time, it's really important to look at those foods. I would say the most common ones are going to be things like gluten, things like dairy. Um, I've seen chocolate be an issue before. Um, corn, um, coffee can often be a big one as well. So um, if you have heartburn issues and there's a certain food that you eat a lot of, um, one of those foods that I just mentioned, maybe nightshades even, um, consider if, if that is kind of driving things, maybe take a break from it and see how you do, see if things calm down a little bit. Um, and then I actually had a patient just uh, yesterday that had, um, or maybe two days ago, um, that had some heartburn issues. And we've worked through some different food sensitivities, some low stomach acid issues. Um, and then one of the last things I think that's going on with them is actually a SIBO issue. So there's something going on where this bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine is contributing to this um, excessive um, kind of gastric reflux issue. So kind of interesting, but I've seen that as well. So um, yeah, I think that I think that covers a lot of our our heartburn uh, issue here. Uh, tell me a little bit about um, this one is one that you wanted to to talk about a little bit more. Uh, peptic ulcers. Um, what are people experiencing if they have peptic ulcers? What are they walking in with? And, and what's kind of the, the mechanism behind a lot of that? So peptic ulcers, it's kind of kind of a bit, a bit of a, uh, is it the chicken or the egg? Um, so what drives peptic ulcers to begin with is a disruption in the mucosal barrier in the stomach uh, that leads to acid actively working on that uh, stomach lining and then pushing through and causing essentially a sore that's wide open that hurts and bleeds. Um, but what will allow the body to be more susceptible to this is this, uh, this thing, it's this bacteria called H pylori, Heliobacter pylori. Um, and whenever somebody has heartburn, whenever somebody has peptic ulcers, all those things, um, primary cares will often do testing for this, for the sole reason of figuring out is that infection there. And if that's what needs to be treated, that's driving it. Um, but what makes you susceptible to having this infection in the first place is low acid. Mm. And so, uh, we got to kind of have to touch on what drives low acid to begin with. So we talked about food sensitivities. Um, stress is one of the biggest things that's, that's going to contribute to low acid. Um, and so think back to every other podcast <laughs> that we've talked about where we've mentioned the blood sugar stuff as it relates to stress. Um, a lot of people, they will have, uh, super a super stressful life and then that's what pushes them to have these ulcers and it's because it depletes your body of all these nutrients that are necessary to produce sufficient acid to fight off heliobacter pylori and then from there maintain sufficient acid um to allow the body the stomach to do its thing so um low acid is going to lead to susceptibility for that infection and then from there the infection is going to deplete that mucosal barrier in the stomach and then from there this the acid can wear away at the stomach lining. Um, and so the uh, way that you can go about treating this, the, at least with the allopathic side, that's where they want to do the PPIs and all that stuff to decrease acid. So then that way it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't uh, hurt. Yeah, it doesn't hurt. And then it, it supposedly doesn't hinder healing on the, uh, on the uh, ulcer that's there. But 
it leaves you open to infections and all those mm-hmm. things. So um, the biggest things that that uh, we see in the way that we do things is dealing with those infections and then really, really heavy support with things uh, like essential fatty acids um, and other gut repair nutrients, uh, things that can help restore the, the mucosal lining of the stomach. Um, and then if there is issues with the burning and things like that beyond that, things like aloe and other naturally soothing uh, foods can can alleviate that holistically rather than leaving you open to uh, infections and all those things. So what's going to make you aware of if you have a peptic ulcer is right when you eat food, you'll get this really, really, really heavy stabbing pain right in your stomach. Um, no burning, all that stuff into the esophagus, but just right in your stomach. A lot of people will feel burning, stabbing pain, cramping, all those things. And then after they digest food for a while and it kind of makes its way through, it will alleviate. Another thing that's going to make you susceptible to this is chronic use of things like ibuprofen, Motrin, uh, Advil, uh, NSAIDs, essentially. All sorts of NSAIDs are going to uh, just totally wear away at that mucosal barrier in the stomach and make you super susceptible to this. Um, and over time, in order to combat the chronic inflammation that those push, essential fatty acids are going to be good to help clear that out as well as support the mucosal barrier of the, of the stomach. So, um that's, uh, that's peptic ulcers. Um, you can get where you get uh, ulcers in the proximal portion of the small intestine. And it's essentially the, the, the same type of thing going on, except with, with that uh, issue, a lot of times what's going on as well is insufficiency of bicarbonate excretion by the, uh, by the pancreas. So the super high acid is maintained into the small intestine, which is what's wearing down on the walls of the small intestine uh, because that basic component is not balancing out that acid, um, which can lead to the ulcers. And then in order to spot, if you have that going on, that's going to be later on in digestion. So think of it as, you know, maybe an hour plus after you eat and you get stabbing pain and maybe your upper right quadrant or just right, right in the middle of your stomach. Um, that could very well be a, uh, duodenal ulcer at that point. Um, but like I said, the, the way that we deal with this is, um, the, Fix the immune barrier, uh, help the body heal uh, and heal that ulcer. And then if there is continued burning and all that stuff, um, deal with it with things like aloe and, and other natural things that can soothe rather than um, artificial things that are going to just decrease acid. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, if anyone listening there has had a peptic ulcer or knows of somebody that has, you know, that it's no fun and it, it just feels terrible. So um, being able to get to the bottom of it and actually allow the stomach to heal so those things uh, go away and don't come back is definitely life-changing. All right, let's jump into gallstones. So gallstones are, gallstones are actually pretty simple. Gallstones are going to form due to what we call sluggish bile. If you're essentially, if your bile, which is made in your liver, stored in your gallbladder and released in digestion, if your bile is too thick, that's going to build up and essentially turn into stones. That's the um, very simple explanation there. Now, the really cool thing with gallstones is you can totally and completely reverse these and break these down naturally. And, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to pass the gallstones um, with the right nutrients. Your body will, will literally smooth the bile out, break them down and get rid of them uh, without any kind of pain or, or any issues like that. Um, if if you do it right. So let's let's talk a little bit about, OK, what causes this bile to be thicker? Um, what's going to cause this dysfunction? And what are some things that we can do about it? How can we go about addressing it um, to reverse these gallstones? So. Um, I, I would say number one, the thing that's going to cause this bile to thicken is going to be things like um, high cortisol. So stress is going to be a big one. Um, insulin resistance is going to be huge. So if you have blood sugar issues, um, chances are that's going to be tied in with your bile flow and it's going to be causing your bile to be too thick. Um, bad fats, obviously fats that are um, you know, hydrogenated fats found in different processed foods, um, uh, inflammatory fats, like inflammatory from inflammatory seed oils, things like vegetable oils, canola oils, all those different things. Uh, all of those things are going to cause issues with our gallbladder health and overall bioflow. Um, low stomach acid is also a big, 
issue, as we mentioned just a little bit ago, uh, because that stomach acid is going to release, or it's going to basically, as it comes down into the intestines, it's going to stimulate the release of bile from the gallbladder. It's going to release, uh, stimulate the release of enzymes from the pancreas and, and so forth. So optimal stomach acid is also really, really important. Uh, I have a lot of patients that don't have a gallbladder. And if you've had your gallbladder taken out, um, you can still have bile flow issues. Now we're going to get into constipation here in a second, which is um, really, really important as far as this conversation goes. Um, but um, essentially, even though you might not have your gallbladder, it's still really important to know that these different issues can still cause your bile to be sluggish and impact your ability to digest food, to absorb fats, um, all those different things. Um, now, gallbladder attacks, I've even seen patients that are essentially in the middle of a gallbladder attack. And essentially, we go through the, the process that I'm talking about. We have to figure out what's driving all the stress on this gallbladder system on thick and thickening the bile flow. Um, so we have to address the main issue there. And then obviously, we have to also figure out um, what nutrients are going to support the thinning of the bile. So um, if gallstones is something that you've had an issue with, you want to consider the different things that I just mentioned there. You want to consider stress in general, high cortisol issues. You want to consider insulin issues and insulin resistance issues. You want to consider low stomach acid. Um, it, one common symptom of low stomach acid is going to be burping with meals. Um, obviously, heartburn is another common one, but burping with meals, especially protein, is a big one. Um, so as far as all these different issues here with the gallbladder and gallstones goes, it's important to understand, is there something massive going on that's causing issues and stress here with your system? And then again, you have to take a holistic approach with that. It's also really important to consider hormones. If you have different hormonal imbalances, specifically I'm, I'm thinking of uh, estrogen dominance with women, that can a lot of times cause issues with your bile flow. Um, birth control is, is in that mix as well. If you're taking birth control, you could be causing your, your bile to be a little bit sluggish and that could be impacting uh, these different things. Um, what kind of nutrients, uh, apart from addressing these main issues, what kind of nutrients can help thin the bile start breaking down these gallstones naturally and basically allow your gallbladder to heal. I would say there's probably a few uh, favorite ones off the top of my head. I'd say vitamin A is going to be huge. This is not vitamin A found in your carrots and, and so forth, but it's going to be more of a, a palmitate derivative. Um, cod liver oil is, is a common one people use for vitamin A. I actually don't see that that's um, as effective. Um, you're going to want something more like a, like a palmitate um, uh, source vitamin A. Um, other things, choline. Choline is awesome for your bioflow and gallbladder and helping thin things down. Um, things like um, essential fatty acids can be really helpful. So we're talking about EPA primarily, which is going to be found in that grass-fed beef. It's going to be found in your fish and fish oils. Um, glycine, which is an amino acid, can be really helpful here as well. Um, uh, and then I'd say probably the other two that I often think about are whole form vitamin C, like camu berries, and then something called TMG, uh, trimethylglycine, which is found in beets. All of those can be extremely, extremely helpful. Um, uh, Dr. Tim, anything else you'd add to that as far as uh, the gallstones, gallbladder health, and overall nutrients for helping to, to heal and reverse a lot of that? Yeah, so I think you did a great job of covering most things. Um, what I, so I'll, I'll kind of describe how I see things most of the time with gallbladder issues and how I go about it. Um, so usually what I see is you'll get your primary gallbladder issue and then from there, stress hormones, estrogens, insulin, whatever, whatever the offender is that we, that we figure out. Um, a lot of times I'll see that you need to almost replace bile with bile salts first before you can even help your, your, the patient's body make any more. Uh, through the vitamin A, taurine, all those things. Um, the reason, the, how I kind of make sense of it in my head is, um, so you got this thick bile that's essentially stuck in there. Um, and you need to kind of re, it's almost like priming an engine where you, you know, push the button on your lawnmower three times before yanking the, you know, the string to, to get it fired up where you have to introduce a little bit of gas into the system for then it to start running again. And so a lot of times you'll need, uh, bile salts, introduce those and it'll, uh, introduce bile to the system and the body goes, wait, we need to, 
we need to get this bile going and keep that going. Uh, and then from there, once, once symptoms of like constipation or gallbladder attacks, all those things, once those sort of resolve a little bit, and it's almost like you have to go from uh, getting things moving to then from there, the body's kind of craving the things that it needs to produce sufficient bile. So get it moving and get it to the point where the body needs those things to make bile and then supplement those things. Um, and then you did a great job of naming all those. Um, another one that I'll, that I'll mention that you left out was, um, grass fed butter. Um, mm. I've seen that a handful of times where patients just need more butter. Um, bile salts as well as just cholesterol itself are huge components of bile. Um, and we always heard, you know, same thing as salt. Cholesterol is bad for you, but cholesterol is found in every single cell membrane in your body. It's found in every single sex hormone, stress hormone, all those things. I guess maybe not every stress hormone, but um, cortisol specifically. Um, and uh, it's precursor to bile and then all sorts of things. So you need cholesterol. You absolutely need it. And uh, arachidonic acid specifically that comes from organic grass-fed butter um, as well as the cholesterol. It, arachidonic acid is phenomenal when from really good sources at reducing inflammation as well. And so... If there is some sort of inflammatory component going on there, not only is it going to provide you with the fuel that it needs to make bile, but it's also going to be super anti-inflammatory. So um, you need to make sure that you're providing your body with the cholesterol it needs to make bile in addition to vitamin A, um, choline, glycine, taurine, um, all the things. So that's that's all that I would add there. Um, I think you covered everything else pretty well. Um Let's see. The next topic is constipation. So constipation, it, we pretty much covered uh, the gallbladder, but one of the biggest things for constipation is just going to be sluggish bile, just like we just talked about. Um, so I'm not going to harp on that too much again, um, but there's another component that is, is really, really big. So one of the first things that I'll jump to in my practice is let's get the gallbladder moving good. Um, and once the gallbladder is functioning, either constipation resolves, and most of the time it does, um, but if it doesn't, what else is going on? And so uh, the next thing on the list is neurotransmitters. So a lot of people are probably thinking, why would neurotransmitters, neuro meaning nerve in your brain, um, why would those affect your gut? Um, serotonin, dopamine, uh, both are made very, very heavily in your gut, and then will move through and you know, go up to your brain and they're the feel good hormones. Um, serotonin specifically is phenomenal for gut motility. Um, I've seen it where patients, they'll take St. John's wort, which will really, really, really push serotonin production. And they go from not being able to use the bathroom at all to being totally regular, um, where it's, it's super, super good for that. Um, so motility can be gallbladder or neurotransmitters. Um, I've seen where um, the, the relationship between serotonin and estrogen progesterone balance is thrown off. Um, and so uh, chronic issues with constipation can be resolved with regulating hormones as well um, as they relate to um, serotonin. So there's plenty of ways to go about constipation, but the most streamlined way is the gallbladder. Most of the time that fixes it. Um, and then dealing with estrogen dominance things like that, or St. John's wort for serotonin production. Um, all those things can play into it. I have heard, um, I haven't seen this as, as commonly, that um, uh, food sensitivities, there's always a food sensitivity when it comes to constipation. Hmm. Uh, I don't find that to be true. I've, I've heard that's the case, um, but they definitely can contribute. We're eliminating you know, provocative food and all that and, and dealing with the underlying immune issues that are driving you to be sensitive to that food. Um, can solve that issues as well. So, um, plenty of ways to go about constipation, but those are the, those are the key ones. Uh, Dr. Joel, is there anything that you think I'm missing there or did I cover that pretty good? Yeah, you covered that. Well, there's actually a couple of things I would add. Um, I, I would say by and large, the, the sluggish bile is by far the biggest issue with constipation. Um, by far the biggest issue. Um, a couple of things I would add that I've, I've seen in practice working with um, just some severe constipation issues uh, with different patients is um, probably number one, I would say, is overall nervous system uh, sympathetic dominance. 
So anytime you're in the sympathetic state, the survival, this fight or flight state, your body doesn't give two rips about a bowel movement. Your body's trying to survive. So um, then we have to, you know, once we, we kind of mention that, then we have to understand, okay, well, what's driving that? Um, and essentially, anytime you're in this sympathetic, this fight or flight, this survival mode, uh, your nervous system is going to shut down digestion and it's going to keep you um, keep your state heightened. Um, so that you can essentially survive. Now, what's going to drive that? Well, obviously stress in general could do that, right? Blood sugar issues, inflammation can drive that. Um, different toxicities can drive that. Um, one of the things I actually saw recently was uh, significant nervous system imbalance. So if you've got, um, for example, with this one patient, he had a concussion. He had uh, actually many concussions throughout high school and, and different things playing football. And so there's this neurological brain imbalance that uh, was directly impacting his overall vagal function, gut health, all those different things, putting him into this kind of the sympathetic fight or flight state. So we had to balance out his nervous system. A lot of times we have to work through the fascial tissues. We have to work through the fascial imbalances and things like that to also balance things out and uh, improve this, this sympathetic state and kind of put their body into more of this parasympathetic uh, healing, resting, and digesting state. Obviously, sleep is important when we talk about that. Um, overall, hydration and water intake is important when it comes to the, the whole sympathetic balance thing there as well. So overly sympathetic issues will can definitely contribute to these constipation problems. And then I would say another one that I've seen from time to time is uh, related just simply with the gut dysbiosis. So uh, once the bile is flowing smoothly, a lot of patients are doing so, so, so much better with bowel movements, but sometimes there's still a little bit of a, a hangup per se, uh, with overall, um, bowel movement health. And every once in a while we'll find, oh, they've got some parasite infections. They've got some different bacterial overgrowth issues and we address those things and, and the gallbladder, the gut health, everything starts really working together well and, and the constipation goes away. So, um, uh, just a couple extra things that I've, that I've kind of seen there. All right. Well, hey, Dr. Tim, we're at the end of our list for uh, what we're going to go over here for part one of the gut health. Uh, let's do this. Um, I'm thinking let's wrap this up. Let's jump back in for part two and uh, and go through the rest of this stuff. And to our audience, I'll just kind of remind you in part two, we're going to be going through, uh, we're going to continue this list of talking about these common digestive complaints that people deal with. We're going to talk about bloating, we're going to talk about gas, diarrhea, abdominal pain, bleeding, different gluten, allergies, things like that. We're going to talk about what's actually going on there, what's causing those issues. And we're going to talk a little bit about how you can go about addressing those issues and, and fixing those issues naturally. Uh, we'll also get into some things talking about some of our favorite gut health foods. And then we'll answer some, some of the most common questions we get uh, with gut health and kind of uh, mentioned a little bit of uh, some of them earlier, but you know, talking about different stool tests, different recommendations there, talking about parasite cleanses, talking about different things that we can do for our gut health. We're going to get into answering some of those questions there in part two. Uh, Dr. Tim, anything else here to wrap up for part one? I think that's it. I was going to look and see what topic was next, but we're, we're wrapping it up. So <laughs> yeah, no, uh, you're good. Yeah, I think that's it. So everybody stay tuned for uh, the next episode next week. Um, we're just going to hop on and record it right now. So, uh, it'll be back to back for us. Um, so, uh, I'm Dr. Tim Augustiniak with Flourish Functional Wellness Center. Um, if you have any questions, anything, you can reach me at, uh, D-R-A-U-G-U-S-T-Y-N-I-A-K.com as well as Instagram, Facebook, all those things. Just look up Flourish Functional Wellness Center or Dr. Tim Augustiniak. Yes, sir. Beautiful. And Dr. Tim, remind us where you're located real quick. Uh, Bentonville, Arkansas. Very nice. Very nice. Would we'll definitely recommend going to see him if you're in that vicinity. Uh, and then to wrap up here, I'm Dr. Joel Miller. You can reach me and uh, contact me at drjoelmiller.com. That's just drjoelmiller.com. Uh, you can find us on uh, YouTube, Instagram, all those fun places. Um, located here in Dallas, Texas. Uh, the practice here is called Freedom Health and Wellness. And uh, uh, I think that's I think that's it. That's a wrap. So we'll see you guys in part two here soon. Uh, as always, let us know if you have any questions from these recordings here, from these podcasts. Um, let us know what you want us to talk about next, and uh, we'll do our best to 
to try and help you guys out from just sharing our experience and um, any advice and tips that we have with things. So thanks for joining, guys. We'll see you guys in the next one.